Good afternoon, everyone. This is Diane Podell. Thank you for joining the Cognitive Systems Institute speaker series today. Um, I'm happy to introduce Alexander Braun, who's the founder of Digi Digital Strategy Boutique Consultancy called Creative Construction Heroes. It's in Berlin, Germany, and they have a wide range of clients across all industries. Online from the very first days of the web in 1995, Alex has been active in developing internet projects and startups. From 2003 to 2007, he developed internet-based business models for the media industry in management positions at Bertelsmann in London, Shanghai, and Toronto. Alexander is the author and co-author of books on Chatbox and the Digital Transformation of Companies and Business Models. He holds a Master's of Business and Economics from the University of St. Gallen and completed executive education programs at INSEAD and MIT. Today he's going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, From ELIZA to Theory and Beyond, The Promise and Challenges of Intelligent Language Controlled Assistance. Thank you, Alex, and I'll turn the call over to you. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Diane. Um, warm welcome to everybody here from Berlin. Thanks for your time. Um, over the course of the next 20 minutes, I'm going to give you a brief overview about uh, the current state of chatbots, um, the promises that they hold and the challenges that they face and what the company's goals are that, that are engaged in operating in this, in this area. So let's jump right in, into it. Um, Apple kind of had, had a head start in 2011 when they launched Siri. Um, after, after this, um, there was quite a long time until the next company followed suit in November 2014 um, with Amazon launching Echo um, in contrast to, uh, to, to Apple and Siri on the iPhone. Um, that's the device speaker in, in, in the homes uh, that is a natural language interface. Afterwards, one big tech company after the other launched uh, Facebook, uh, launched Facebook M in October 2015. Then Microsoft Cortana in December 2015. Google Assistant May 2016. And uh, last but uh, definitely not least, also IBM, of course, uh, Watson Conversation as a natural language interface. Um, so with all these big tech players on board um, and uh, with, with them focusing a lot of investment in this area, uh, it became quite obvious that something big seem, seemed to be happening in, in this space. And of course, it received also uh, ex expected media coverage. Uh, as you see here, forget apps, now the bots take over. So uh, basically, natural language interfaces um, are supposed to substitute apps and become the new way of interacting with computers. Um, why chatbots are replacing apps? So lots, lots of these articles predicting $200 billion chatbot disruption, um, the next trillion dollar company that will be based on AI agents, uh, natural language based uh, uh, chatbots. Um, so it went basically um, quite in quite a, quite a media hype in this whole space. And over the course of the last few months, it has cooled down significantly. Suddenly, the headlines are quite different. Um, are we still talking about the chatbot revolution? We see here, um, why does Siri seem so dumb? Facebook's spammy chatbots must improve and fast. Please, Facebook, don't make me speak to your awful chatbots, and, and so on. Um, Turing test, tougher Turing test exposes chatbot stupidity. Um, is the whole chatbot trend one big misunderstanding? And even uh, David Marcus, um, the head of uh, Facebook Messenger, said that the whole chatbots uh, were really and are still really overhyped. Um, and let's be honest, chatbots kind of suck. So over the course of the last few months, there's quite a big change in um, chatbots will rule the world to um, they're not useful at all. So where are we really in this space? What's, what's really going on there? Um, are we still in this stage um, of Clippy? Um, you probably all know and, and remember um, uh, Clippy, the, the natural language operated 
um, assistant that used to live within Microsoft Office. Um, everybody hated it from, from the get-go. Uh, even the first um, focus group test that they did with it, um, people hated it and didn't like it. Um, but um, it was introduced anyway. I mean, even Bill Gates seems to be a little bit annoyed by Clippy here. Um, and that kind of was the thing that most of the people felt. Clippy was this kind of assistant that always seemed to get in your way. You wanted to get a job done, and, and there was Clippy, um, and you, you had to close Clippy first in order to really be able to, to get some work done. Um, so with these assistants, are we in the space of Clippy still, or are we moving towards, uh, towards some real AI as we as we seen it uh, in her. I'm not sure if all of you have seen this movie. If you haven't, I highly recommend uh, you to watch it. Um, in this movie, Samantha is this chatbot AI system that Theodore falls in love with, and um, so it's it's a really really good movie. I highly recommend you to watch it. Um, when Siri was asked about what she thinks about Samantha, um, she wasn't that happy about it. Her portrayal of intelligent agent is beyond artificial. No, I'm, in, in my opinion, she gives artificial intelligence a bad name. So if you ask a lot of people um, that are kind of frustrated with Siri, really, um, that's probably what they would say about Siri. So what are some of the challenges that, um, that we are facing here in this space? Um, now my presentation was stuck, here we go. Um, it helps probably to, to take a look a little bit, a look uh, into how we got here. Um, chatbots are not really a new phenomenon. This is a book I wrote on chatbots in 2003, so 13 years back already. Um, so, and this by no means was something new back then. Um, the first chatbot was developed by Joseph Weizenbaum um, of MIT, who developed it in 1966, uh, ELISA, which was a natural language system um, that kind of played or staged um, psychotherapists. So by simply paraphrasing or answering, uh, putting questions back to the person talking to the system, it mimicked um, the psychotherapist without really having any intelligence or, or complex uh, logic in the system. What Weizenbaum really wanted to prove with the system is that humans are irreplaceable and that humans will be very annoyed quite quickly when communicating with a computer system in natural language. The result, however, was quite to the contrary. A lot of people spent hours and hours talking to Eliza and um, telling Eliza uh, a lot of very private details that they weren't even sharing with their friends. So this moved Weizenbaum to become really a, a fierce critic of computer systems and artificial intelligence because he feared that um, humans might lose um, what, is, what is special about human beings and, and computers might threaten that. Um, we have some of these, these fears also today uh, with the advancement of AI, uh, with one one uh, one part of the the, um, the audience saying basically it's the big, biggest threat for human uh, mankind, and the other uh, saying it's it's the best best thing that ever happened. Um, what happened after Eliza um, was was many years later um, was a switch from from these these crude DOS prompt or, or um, command prompt systems um, into the next step of graphical user interfaces. So idea was here to improve the usability of systems, to make it easier for people to interact with computer systems. And the logical next step uh, in this evolution is using natural language because humans are, it's the most natural thing for them to communicate uh, with language. Um, so the whole idea is to make systems even more usable than they currently are uh, with graphical user interfaces. 
one other motivation behind that, and uh, that is also why uh, especially Microsoft and Facebook are driving this, uh, this shift to natural language systems and message-based systems, um, is to create a third runtime after the web and after smartphone apps um, to get a hold of the market. They, they basically um, ha don't own the opera mobile operating systems, Android and iOS. So in order to be able to assert more control over what they can do on these, uh, on these devices, um, their goal is to establish messaging as a, as a third runtime to, to, um, to beat Google and Apple here in, in this space. So these are several motivations for, for driving these systems forward. One is the usability and, and also um, assertion of power in this market. Now, what are the challenges that we're facing today? Why was there this sudden switch from, from uh, overhype to now really um, kind of frustration, frustration with chatbots? Um, it helps to first look into the different different bot types that we that we currently have. Uh, most of the chatbots that, that we are talking about today are rules-based bots. So um, Siri, Cortana, Viv. Viv is uh, the company founded by the guys who developed Siri, um, was just recently sold to Samsung. Um, these bots depend on a huge database with finite information that is coded and created by humans. So basically, any information that's in there um, is kind of a sophisticated IVR system, so to speak. Um, information that's not in there, the bot can't answer. So uh, this, this, these are the limitations of these rules-based bots because, um, first of all, people don't really know what, what the scope of, of information or the scope of knowledge of the system is when they communicate with it. So they have to find out um, if the system is able to answer the questions or not. And uh, other than um, with graphical user faces where you sort of have, have an overview what's there and what you can do, it's really opaque with these systems because you don't really know what you can do. The other one is um, created, uh, created bots. Um, they're kind of a merger between these rules-based bots and human intervention. So basically, um, they also rely on a huge database of uh, kind of pre-coded information, but um, if the bot can't answer a certain question, um, it passes a message on to customer service agent um, to answer this question. So sort of a combination of, of rules-based system with a ticketing system, so to speak. So both of these systems um, aren't really solving or, or have, have a lot of uh, shortcomings still. Um, one, uh, the rules-based system, as I said, uh, can be understood if it's not very good as a, as a sort of IVR, the created bots more like a ticketing system because if the message is passed on to the human operator, it's then not really real-time anymore. And it's also not kind of the, the most natural uh, interaction that we expect from natural language interfaces. Uh, some of the results we see here, the problems we see um, can be due to design flaws. Um, this is a bot uh, within uh, the Facebook Messenger. And we see here somebody wanted to unsubscribe from, from the CNN news feed. And um, the bot apparently didn't understand that. Although can I unsubscribe doesn't seem to be such a long tail request. Um, the frustration was quite high um, that, that this was not possible. Um, another design flaw here is actually executing the identified command. So here um, also within the messenger, somebody unsubscribed and, and the bot confirmed this, but then kept on sending additional news which also is not what the user really wanted. Um, and another one uh, that we see here is due to um, the design of the personality of, of this chatbot, um, because sometimes it can, they can get a little bit overboard, the developers, um, designing these personalities. Um, this bot was supposed to 
give the user weather and weather forecasts uh, for their location and so on, but um, it became very playful and it was hard to decipher what, what actually the weather now actually is because the personality was taking up all the message. Um, so that all these things are quite frustrating for the user and uh, make them quickly switch off these kind of bots. Um, one other problem, and this is due to these rules-based systems, um, is the maintenance and the, the up-to-dateness, so to speak, of the database. Um, this is a request that was put not too, not too long ago to, to Siri, um, who is a Democratic candidate for president, and Siri didn't find an answer and basically just, to return, just returned the web search. Um, also, this question doesn't seem to be such a long tail question that a normal human user would expect it not to answer it. So um, it's hard for the user then to grasp what kind of the scope of coverage uh, this, this Siri, uh, Siri system has, and it can quickly lead to a lot of frustration on the user side. This is one question I asked it yesterday um, in German. I apologize for that because my settings are this way and I wanted to try out if the same problems exist here and, and that's proven. I was asking who, who on the left-hand side were candidate uh, for the US presidential, so who's running, uh, who's the candidate for the presidency in the US, and this couldn't even answer that and returned a web search that was also totally out of date. Ted Cruz uh, is running uh, as a candidate, or John McAfee is, uh, is the candidate. So um, totally out of place, every, every simple web search would have returned a better result than that. Um, so that, that's also quite frustrating on the user's end. Now, a more complex problem also um, is common sense. So um, I'm going to quickly run through, through this. Uh, some examples here, user, Siri call me an ambulance, and then Siri answers, okay, from now on, I call you an ambulance. So these are some of the examples. I have some more here, um, but uh, in, in respect to, to the time left, I just leave you with, with this example, but there are a few things that, that are quite complex for computers un to understand that are very simple for humans to decipher. Quickly switch, flip through those. There are a couple of projects that try to address that, uh, creating common sense databases, um, OpenPsych, Microsoft, and so on. Um, now, the vision of, of the chatbot is really um, to reduce the friction on the user's end. But what we're seeing here, um, uh, voice tends to look like the unlimited general purpose UI, but actually it only works if you narrow the domain. So it has the opposite impact. It actually often increases friction because the user doesn't know what the, how narrow the domain is or how, how wide the domain is. And in, in turn, it becomes as opaque as a common DOS prompt, basically. Um, so these are some learnings that uh, that, that we can draw from that, especially with regards to Siri. So Siri went live with huge, huge expectations that they basically, that you can ba basically answer anything, unlimited general purpose UI. Um, the real reality was, however, that it's limited to a not very clearly defined domain. And um, the problem user has to find out with trial and error what the domain is. And uh, the result of that is uh, if the user finds out what the domain is, he stops exploring. So even if Siri is improved, it's hard for the user to find out that it has improved because the user learned what the scope of the domain is and doesn't try new things because it's not, there's no visual representation of certain changes. So um, then, then, you, then you're basically stuck with a Siri that basically uh, sends you messages to your contacts or Maybe you can ask it for the weather, but beyond that, you don't really explore it anymore. Um, Amazon approached it a little bit different with Alexa. Um, they, from the get-go, set quite a narrow scope of domains. Uh, it was less opaque for, for the users this way, and, and therefore less disappointment. But um, there comes a the problem of efficiency and effectiveness. So if I 
use Alexa to order products from Amazon, I can tell it to order, uh, order a sponge, but then I have to open uh, my Alexa app on my iPhone or my, on my smartphone, um, go to the shopping list, select sponges from there, select search Amazon for sponges, wait for iOS open to, uh, to open the Amazon app, scroll down and then check out. So a lot of steps that are involved after that that don't really make it efficient to order this way. So, um, and if it's not more efficient than, than the graphical user interface system that, is, uh, uh, that I could also use, then people are not going to really use it. Um, here are some examples of um, how much tabs are involved. So if I, if I use um, a text-based system here on the left-hand side to order pizza, um, it takes me 73 tabs uh, to actually place my order. So um, the alternative on the right-hand side with a, with a classical app, um, there are only 16 tabs involved. So from the efficiency point of view, um, it, uh, it, it doesn't really make sense in this context to use the system. Um, also, if, if there, are not, there are things to discover, it's much easier to discover new things, um, different pizza versions and so on, if I have a graphical representation of those. So where do bots work? Um, as a conclusion, um, there are some usage scenarios where bots are, are uh, good to use, like um, if, if it makes sense to have a lot of information in one thread. So if I book a flight, all, all the information is in one thread and I don't need to go through a lot of emails and, and pull all this information together. I can use the same thread, thread to reply to customer service, to change my flight and so on. So that's, uh, that's one user scenario where it makes sense. Another one is if um, I use this sort of horizontal AI system, um, but um, via APIs access a lot of different other systems that um, execute orders that I place uh, through the text-based system. Um, so um, a combination basically of, of language operated and efficient, uh, efficient uh, graphical uh, system that, that we are seeing here. But these are early iterations of this. So um, we need to find out more really uh, which, which are the best contexts to, to make it work. Some, some of uh, the things that you should think about um, when, when evaluating whether bot is a, um, a, good, a good system to use in a specific context is um, if interactions are quick. So the fewer the number of back and forth uh, required, the better, because if you have to type back and forth, it becomes quickly very inefficient and often graphical representation is much easier. Um, simple interactions, so not too many options to choose from. So if I'm buying shoes, for instance, um, I have hundreds of shoes to select from. If I would need to do this in some sort of a chat-based session, it becomes very inefficient. Um, context is also quite important. So if, if you can pull in as much information as possible from the get-go, so I don't have to key it in, then it makes a lot of sense. Here's a taxi service, for instance, here in Germany that uses um, the WhatsApp uh, messaging system and it automatically pulls in my location because my device knows that and uh, so I don't need to key in where I am in order to direct a taxi my way. Um, so the more I can infer about the, the context, the better and the quicker the interaction. Um, also very, very important uh, that the users maintain control. So clear permissions, um, not as we saw in this example before when the user wanted to unsubscribe and the system didn't really respond. And last but not least, users don't have investment in existing apps. So if I, if I already use apps for a specific use case and I spend a lot of time personalizing this app already, then it will be very hard to switch the user to a different um, voice control system now or messaging system. Um, so a good use case is usually something that is new or um, only involves temporary interactions. That as a quick tour de force uh, through, through chatbots. I hope uh, there were some inter in interesting insights for you and uh, thank you very much. So now I'm open for questions. 
Thank you, Alex. That was that was great. That was fun. Um, audience, please press star one to unmute your line to ask questions. Hey, Alex, Jim Spohr here. Thanks for uh, another great presentation. I appreciated your uh, presentation you made in Orlando, Florida earlier this year as well. So good to reconnect. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so here's the question, and it's a kind of a tough one. Uh, and I, I wish I could read your chat book, book uh, but my German's not so good. Uh, but uh, do you think that common sense reasoning is going to be a required prerequisite to really get good uh, conversational systems? And my second question is um, perception, like speech recognition, image recognition, has really benefited from, you know, deep learning, machine learning with large, big data sets. Do you think it would ever be possible to create a large enough data set to get um, good conversational systems or good common sense reasoning systems? Yeah, that, that really is a tough question. <laughs> um, I think, like, for example, this open psych database, uh, it's been, been filled with all these common sense reasoning for over the last 30 years. Um, so that's a very uh, tough, uh, tough one to crack, I think. Um, and uh, will these systems be useful even without common sense? I think to a certain degree, yes. I think a lot of things you can do already today with some of these systems um, provide value already. Um, but but if, if you really want to get to, to this level that you feel that you're communicating with an another one, another human being, so to speak, and and not always have to think about what the other understands exactly. Um, I think common sense often um, often comes uh, becomes the limiter of, of the conversation then if, if that's not understood by the system. So I think uh, to answer your question, I think uh, yes, there are probably there, there are quite a number of use cases where these bots can provide value even without common sense, but um, for the for the full scope of the communication, it's, uh, there there are many use cases where where it gets uh, gets problematic without it. Um, and sorry, the second question um, about about image recognition and uh, I. Yeah, do you think it's possible to get enough, uh, a big enough data set to, to solve the common sense and conversation problem, or is that just the wrong way to go about it? Because big data sets help with speech recognition and image recognition, but so far haven't been fully successfully applied in the common sense reasoning and conversation area. Do you think big data sets is the way to go, though, ultimately? Um. I'm not 100% sure, to be honest. I mean, like I said, this open psych, uh, they have been adding data sets over the course of the last 30 years. Um, I'm not sure if, if, if that has really improved uh, the whole understanding of common sense and, and language yet. Um, so I'm not sure if, if um, we will have the same results here that we, that we saw with images uh, and image recognition. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Alex. Other questions for Alex? Alex, just in the remaining minute or so, this is Scott McLeod. Thanks for a great presentation. Uh, what's your um, understanding of the interlingual chatbot space, the translation chatbot space? Uh, what are some of the interesting limitations thus far that might inform subsequent de developments, whether it be big data sets or other approaches with AI, for example? Um, hi, Scott. Um, thanks for your question. Um, so, the, so the question is, how, how can these bots be used um, to, to communicate between different languages, so to speak? Or, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not really, um, I, I just trying to think of, of bots that actually uh, do this in, in different languages. I'm not quite sure. I, uh, on top of my head, I don't can't really think of an example that that does this between different different languages. Aside aside of the fact just the the language language translation, but but not so much um, the actual um, understanding or or, or 
um, translation on on a on a chat based level i'm I'm not quite sure sorry great I thank you very much for your fascinating presentation really timely <laughs> thank you thank you thanks for the questions and thanks Alex we're out of time but I just want to um, thank you for the great presentation thanks for being our presenter today and audience thanks for attending we'll see you next week thanks again Alex thank you